Hello again, brethren. Again, I wanted to do a King James only short video here. Again, looking at why English. And if you have time, look at some verses about the 66 books in the Bible and some voices in Ken Ham has come out promoting a different Bible. And even Stephen Anderson, who has done all these great King James only documentaries and videos, he's come out basically against the King James Bible now. He said it's got errors now, but he says it doesn't count because he calls it a typo, right? No, again, he's flip-flopped on his own belief here. I mean, he can call himself King James only if he wants to, but uh, he's basically gone against everything he's ever taught, and he's acting like it's no big deal, which is very shocking. And again, maybe he'll think I'm overreacting to it, but we'll see here in a second. I just wanted to point out a few things. 2 Timothy chapter 2 here. Again, get a King James Bible. If you don't know what we're talking about here, uh, basically, there are these new Bible versions. We're just telling you God has preserved His Word. And it just happens to be here in English in the King James Bible. And of course, there's more than that. We've gone over a lot of examples and so forth. And you can go on and on. I wanted to add a few more verses to that and look side by side at some scriptures as well. And we'll start here, verse 8. Number seven, consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ, the seed of David, was raised from the dead according to my gospel, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds. But the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sakes, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Study show thyself to prove unto God a workman. And needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. So we notice multiple things here. I wanted to point out, here he is, he's suffering trouble, even in the bonds, but the word of God is not bound. And we see even today, they want to try and bind the word of God. And it goes with everything they believe, right? They want to bind the word of God to one specific piece of paper thousands of years ago that they don't have. It exists only in their mind, right? That's why I always say they want to go back to the original. And then they want to bind the Word of God to one specific old Hebrew dead language. And they want to bind it there and keep it there. It's never been that way, folks. The Word of God liveth and abideth forever. 1 Peter chapter 1, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. By the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever, for all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof fadeth, falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Again, we see God's word liveth and abideth forever, right? Again, your flesh is like the grass, but God's word endures forever. Powerful. I want to look at Psalm 45, 1 real quick, which someone brought up. My heart is indicting a good matter. I speak of the things which I have made touching the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. It goes on to foretell, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ, verse 6. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. Right? It's interesting that his tongue is the pen of a ready writer, right? Now, two things that the no pure scripture doctrine people, who, again, want you to have all these hundred different English versions that all contradict themselves, one thing they always do is talk about going back to the original, right? Or they have to rediscover the original. Again, God wrote with his finger on the stone tablets, you don't have the original, right? You either believe God preserved his word 
or you don't. Oh, look at a couple verses here. Well, can God preserve a perfect copy? Right? Where's the precedent for that? Let's go to Deuteronomy 17, Old Testament. And it's foretelling when they're coming into the land and all these things. Again, so it's prophecy as well, and it's a biblical precedent. Verse 14 on Deuteronomy 17. When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, and shalt possess it, and shalt dwell therein, and shalt say, I will set a king over me, like as all the nations that are about me, thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose, one from among thy brethren, shalt thou set king over thee. Thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother. But he shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to the end that he should multiply horses. For as much as the Lord has said unto you, he shall henceforth return no more that way, neither shall he multiply wives to himself. That his heart turn not away, neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. And it shall be, when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write him a copy of this law, and a book out of that which is before the priests of the, Lev the Levites. And it shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life, and he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to keep all the words of this law and this statutes, to do them, that his heart be not lifted up above his brethren, and that he turn not aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, to the end that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. So two things I want to point out here. First, the precedent is, right, God uses a king here, which before they even had a king, he's telling them he'll use a king to make a copy of the law. So is the king authorized to make a copy of the law? Yes or no? Yes, right? Second of all, guess what? It's not the original. It's a copy. He's writing a copy in a book. Out of that's before the priests. So... Not only do we have the precedent of a copy in a book from a king, right? Again, biblical precedent. And then we see later Josiah reads all the law to the people, right? He gives it to the people. Now, what do the other versions have to compare to this? Do they have a king? Do they have any of this? No. And they're still looking for the original, right? They don't believe he can use a copy. Even though that's what it clearly says here, right? Very interesting. For the people who want to go back to the original, you don't have the original, do you? Again, the word of God liveth and abideth forever. They want, when they say they want an original, they want to go back to an old piece of paper. That's what it is. Not the words themselves that live and abide forever. Let's look at Isaiah 28 real quick here. Again, Isaiah 28, Old Testament. Start on verse 7 here. But they have also also have erred through wine and through strong drink or out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up of wine. They are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. For all tables are full of vomit and filthiness, so that there is no place clean. Whom shall he teach knowledge, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast, for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people, to whom he said, This is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing. Yet they would not hear, but the word of the Lord was upon them, precept upon precept, precept upon precept. Line upon line, line upon line, here a little, and there a little, that they might go and fall backward, and be broken, and snared, and taken. Wherefore, hear the word of the Lord, ye scornful men that rule his people, which is in Jerusalem. Because ye have said, we have made a covenant with death, and with hell are we at an agreement. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come unto us. For we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood have we hid ourselves. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation of stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Judgment also will I lay to the line, and righteousness to the plummet. And the hail shall sweep away 
the refuge of lies, and the water shall overflow the hiding place. And your covenant with death shall be disannulled, and your agreement with hell shall not stand. When the overflowing skirt shall pass through, then you shall be trodden down by it. Mm. Powerful. Notice here, it's talking about the word of the Lord was upon them, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, and there a little. Notice, it's talking about the word of the Lord, and also we see here a little, and there a little. Very interesting, right? But, verse 11, For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. Again, here it is. God is going to speak with another tongue. Right? Here it is. They say, why English? Right? It should be, the question they should be asking is, why not English? First of all, you know, English is spoken on what? All the seven continents, right? North America, South America, Europe, Asia, Africa, Australia, even the people in Antarctica, there's probably some English people there, right? So on all the continents, people speak English. It's a global language, right? They act like only certain small percentage of people, right? Notice they don't ask, well, why is Old Testament was in Hebrew? Weren't there people who spoke besides Hebrew, right? Again, the Tower of Babel, when the languages were scattered, is in Genesis, right? So there were people who did not speak Hebrew, right? So why is it only in Hebrew? That's just the way he did it, folks. It didn't mean that they didn't want them to be saved. Again, Greek, right? What about all the people, the languages were scattered. What about all the people who didn't speak Greek? Does that mean they couldn't be saved? No, folks. But it was in Greek that most people agree that, right? What about the people who couldn't speak Latin, right? You notice they don't ask that about any of these languages. It's only about English that they have a problem with, right? Again, it's not an argument, folks. It's a global language. It's huge. And if you're going to a place to teach them, you're not going to teach them three different languages, Hebrew, Greek, and Latin, instead of just teaching them the perfect English you have here in the King James Bible, folks. That wouldn't make any sense, would it? Obviously not. But we see here, it's foretold what? He's going to speak with another tongue. Now, this is interesting because depending on how you look at it. So let's look here. John 19, New Testament, verse 19. And Pilate wrote a title and put it upon the cross. And the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. This title then read many of the Jews. For the place where Jesus was crucified was not of the city. And it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Now, if these three languages are contemporary with each other at the Bible times in the New Testament, and God is going to speak in another tongue, then couldn't it be another tongue from these three, right? Another tongue from these three biblical languages that are simultaneous, right? Something like, oh, I don't know, English? Wouldn't that make sense? Again, he's going to use a king. He's going to make a copy. You're not going to have to go to the original. He's going to have Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Again, why do they attack the King James Bible? They say, why does he use Latin in these places for these verses? Again, that just proves the point more. And he foretold he's going to speak in another tongue, English. Again, a global language, right? Just some more verses I want to add about that. Very interesting. And since we're talking about languages here, I, w I saw an interesting video a long time ago about Chuck Misler talking about the Bible. Who knows what seminar it was? I couldn't find it again. I'm not going to look through 100 hours of Chuck Misler or whatever. And again, he's not King James only, but he should be. He should have been, right? But one thing he made about the languages, again, most of this, this part of the world from the east writes toward, right, the Tower of Babel, toward Jerusalem. And on the western side, they're writing left to right, right, toward Jerusalem as well. But I think we can go a step further there, right? So if they're all writing toward where this happened, well, from one side of the world, you're writing vertically up and down, right? So they're all writing toward this direction, except 
we write from left to right, and the other side of the world is writing vertically, and there you go, right? Very interesting, the languages come together like that. I just think it's an interesting observation. Again, whether you believe that's a coincidence or not, it's just interesting. Now, to continue here. Uh, one of the additions that we're going to be selling, and I wanted to just uh, take note of this because it says here, uh, it is the best English translation I have ever read. And who said that? Well, Dr. John MacArthur said that. And so we will have that in our bookstores at the attractions, as I said, and online as well. And we actually have produced a special edition. We've worked with the publisher on a special edition that I'll ask you about a little later on uh, into the interview. But uh, why is this called the Legacy Standard Bible, LSB for short? Yeah, the legacy that we're talking about is really the legacy of the New American Standard Bible, which is an excellent translation. And it's specifically the philosophy of translation that the NASB represents. You see, there are a lot of different ways that people can translate the Bible, a lot of different methodologies. And the NASB represents what we call a word-for-word -word correspondence, that the word you see in your English translation corresponds with a word or words in Hebrew. There's a close connection between the two. The goal of a word-for-word -word translation isn't to tell you what the author meant. That's a teacher's job, a preacher's job. What a translation should do is show you what God wrote. That's the key. And the legacy... All right, so we see Ken Ham who's well known for Answers in Genesis, again, which, again, does a lot of good work on creation, science type things. We're going to put out a video, the most accurate Bible translation that he's now selling, I guess in his theme part, a Legacy Standard Bible, which, as you saw the guy admit, it's basically just the NASB, which, again, he should know better than that, right? And hopefully somebody tells him, who's around them, but I think they like the newer versions because they change certain things in Genesis, add the Nephilim doctrine and so forth, right, that they like. But first we'll notice the man said a word-for-word -word translation. Let's look at Daniel 5 real quick. Start on verse 25. Again, the story about how they're trying to interpret the writing, right? The hand of God wrote the writing. Verse 25, and this is the writing that was written. Mene, mene, tekel, you far sin, right? Now, like you said, if you're trying to do a word-for-word -word translation, what are you going to get from mene in English, right? Look at verse 26. This is the interpretation of the thing. Mene, God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. So again, what word-to-word -word translation are you going to get from mene in English? Or in other languages. It's not going to happen, folks. It's a heavenly word. It means God had numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Right? They didn't know what it is. It had to be interpreted by God using Daniel here. So again, just because it's not a word to one singular word doesn't mean it's not a correct translation or interpretation. Right? Is it? And we see God is teaching us that here as well. So, again, anybody who will question italics or things in the King James Bible, that doesn't mean it's an incorrect reading or translation, right? No, it's perfect without error. So, and the NASB, why is it called the NASB? Because it came off of the ASB or ASV or whatever. It's the new ASB, basically. And now you've got the LSB on top of that. Again, they've already been destroyed multiple times by the King James Bible, right? Because they add the same type of errors that we saw in Genesis 6. Instead of giants, they put in Nephilim, right? Instead of 1 Corinthians 1, they put being saved instead of saved when talking about the power of God. It's got the same type of errors, so if we look up LSB, Genesis 6, 4, what does it say? The Nephilim were on the earth in those days. Again, I think they like that Nephilim false doctrine. And instead of the Lord, 
right? So let's look here. And we see Genesis 6. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, and his days shall be 120 years. They were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that. When the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, they bare children to them. The same became mighty men which were of renown, old men of renown. Again, giants. Now, why do they put Nephilim there, right? Because they can't, again, from what I've seen, they don't know what it means. Isn't that interesting? So they're sure not, they don't know what it means, but they know the Bible can't be right, right? It means anything but what the Bible says, giants. Uh, it shows that they don't, they pretend to know these things like Hebrew and things. It's a dead language, folks. They're pretending to know. They don't trust that God has preserved his word. And they certainly don't trust that he's used Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. And nor do they believe he can speak to them in another tongue. And nor do they believe he can make a copy. They believe they have to go back to the original. Right? And so here's a short clip of Religion for Breakfast where he basically admits that. ...of renown, Gilgamesh being a quintessential example of an ancient Near Eastern semi-divine hero. The word Nephilim itself can also shed some light on these beings. This Hebrew word has the same root as the verb to fall. So scholars think we should translate Nephilim as the fallen or the fallen ones. But fallen in what sense? Fallen from... Now here's a question for you. Why are the experts trying to use the root word to figure out what Nephilim means? Right? I thought they spoke Hebrew. I thought they knew all these things. Again, they don't know anything but that the Bible must be wrong when it says giants. That's all they know for sure. Think about how biased that is, right? Think about how perverted that is. But that's an example we get. And again, we see the LSB has many of the same problems. So no, you shouldn't be using the LSB. And if you need money that bad, you'd be better off doing a fundraiser than selling a newer Bible version in your Noah's Ark shop. Ken Ham should know better. Then we get to another example that came up, Deuteronomy 22. I mean, Deuteronomy 21, excuse me. Again, let's look at verse 22. And if a man have committed a sin worthy of death, and he be to be put to death, and thou hang him on a tree. His body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day. For he that is hanged is accursed of God. That thy land be not defiled, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. So this is the verse that I saw bringing up about Stephen Anderson, right? which is a guy who's made lots of King James only documentaries. Why well, it's so shocking that he would come out for no reason and basically undo all his beliefs just for this verse because he doesn't like the way it sounds, right? Not because there's an error there. He doesn't like the way it sounds. Therefore, he decides he's going to rewrite the Bible now, right? And I didn't believe it at first, but... Let's look at a clip here. Mark Ward, who hates the King James Bible, actually came out to defend it in this case because he hates Stephen Anderson too, it seems like. And that's the only reason he came out. Let's look at a clip here, see what I'm talking about. So here's what Anderson posted on Facebook just a week ago as I released this video. This threw me for a loop, Anderson says. When I was preaching tonight, Deuteronomy 21, 22, and if a man have committed a sin worthy of death, and he be to be put to death, and thou hang him on a tree. And then, of course, the passage goes on to say that you take him down. I've always just read this as, and he be put to death. But it says, and he be to be put to death. It's a typo, Anderson says. I looked it up in Hebrew, and it should just say, and he be put to death. It's funny, because I think I've always just read it that way anyway, because my brain was correcting the typo. One would assume that such a statement would be incendiary from Anderson. Again, I just haven't been able to make myself listen to enough Stephen Anderson in just the way I would have predicted. One man wrote, KJV has it right. Anderson replied, I'm sure the translators got it right, but this is a typo probably introduced by the printer. 
Even this is not acceptable to most King James onlyists, and Anderson got exactly the kind of response I would have expected from another commenter. No, it is not a typo. If you think you have found an error in the King James Bible, you are the error. Why are you placing doubt on the King James Bible and its accuracy? This is not a typo. Thank you. One commenter who I happen to know was commenting tongue-in-cheek wrote, Impossible. King James is perfect. You're one of them modern perversions guys, aren't ya? And Anderson replied, the translation is perfect, but every book has typos. That's Anderson's view. The King James is perfect, but typos are okay. One wonders how that might apply to New Testament textual criticism, but I digress. Anderson went on in the thread to give what he described as more evidence that it is a typo. Anderson quoted Tyndale's translation and the Bishop's Bible at Deuteronomy 21-22, neither of which contains this admittedly difficult phrasing, he be to be put to death. He's right, of course, and this is apropos. Anderson wrote the Bishop's Bible was the rough draft that the King James translators were working from, and Anderson is completely right, and it reads just like the Hebrew in this verse. There is no way the King James translators changed it to be to be. It was obviously just an error by the printers. Anderson is getting in trouble. And there it is, folks. Again, one one little tweet caused all this craziness, right? Now he's got Mark Ward, of course, coming out, pretending to care about the King James Bible, which he doesn't. Spends his life attacking it. But it was very surprising, right? Because what you'll find is both Mark Ward and Stephen Anderson admit grammatically there's no problem here, right? He be to be put to death, well, that sounds like he's not dead yet when he's put on the tree. That sounds like it's foretelling the Lord Jesus Christ, right? So what's the problem? He doesn't like the way it sounds. They both agree grammatically it's correct. They both agree it's been in the King James Bible since before they were born. But he says it's a typo. Well, here's the problem with saying it's a typo, right? A typo is I put a B... Where there was supposed to be an H there, he and B. A typo is, you know, adding an A instead of an O. That's a typo. He wants to remove words now. He wants to remove two words from the verse, which he admits will change the meaning to not be him be put on the tree alive. Even though the New Testament foretells this, uses this, foretelling the Lord Jesus Christ, right? So no, you can't just say, well, it's not an error because it's a typo, right? And notice his first message, which really reveals it, right? He was thrown for a loop. So what did he do? He went and looked in the Hebrew. Wait a minute. I thought he believed the King James Bible was perfect. Why is he looking in the Hebrew? And he's blaming the printer. So why did he go back to the Hebrew? He's blaming the printer. Why did he go back to the Hebrew? I thought that was done with. Because he's retranslating it on the fly. He knows better than the translators of the King James Bible. He went back to the Hebrew, but then... He went back to the Bishop's Bible and the Tyndale Bible. Multiple things wrong with this. He's saying the King James Bible is perfect. It supersedes other English versions because God has blessed this one here. He's the one who used the king as he said he would in the scriptures. He's the one who did it seven times purified. He's the one who did all these things. God had access to the Bishop's Bible. God had access to the Tyndale's Bible. He could have easily used them. Almighty God himself chose the King James Bible. Right? So now, not only do you have to say the translators made an error, or the printer made an error, you have to say, trying to go back and use the Bishop's and the Tyndale's, you're trying to say that God made an error, and that we should go back to using those, which he himself doesn't even use those folks bearing false witness. And he said, probably the printer made an error bearing double false witness. And now he's saying the King James Bible has an error. How does he know? He went back to the Hebrew. The same thing he accuses James White of. 
the same thing he accuses all these perversions of. He's James White 2.0 now, folks. And now the doubt has been sown, right? He said he studied this for years. He never noticed this wording and that it must be a typo. Why? Because he's been preaching it wrong all these years. Instead of being corrected by God's word, he looked for an excuse why he was right and God's word was wrong. That's called pride, right? That's called pride. And now he's opened the door. Well, if this is a typo, you can just take out these words, which he admits will change the prophecy, will change the meaning, whether he's going alive on the tree or dead on the tree, which he admits will change the meaning, which is removing words, not just a typo, right? Well, now he's opened the door. How many other typos are there that he has never noticed in his years of study? Again, this is only from a couple months ago. So how many other typos might there be where he has to go in and go back to Hebrew to figure out what the Bible really says? Again, he's pretending to be King James only still. He might be King James preferred, except when he doesn't like what it says, then he'll go back to the Hebrew. He'll go back to the Bishop's Bible. He'll go back to Tyndale's Bible. And then he'll just call it a typo so there's not an error, right? A typo doesn't count as an error, except he already admitted you'd have to remove these words. And he'd already admitted it changes the meaning because he did a response to Mike Ward where he doubled down, which is surprising. Where he said, well, in the Old Testament, they were killed before they put on a tree. Again, the Old Testament foretells the New Testament, not the other way around. Saying to be foretells the Lord Jesus Christ better is not an argument. We see the wounds in his hand. You're not given that in Genesis 40. That's a detail that's revealed later on. Genesis 40 was before Deuteronomy to begin with, right? And again, we see in the New Testament, they refer back to this, pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was there in person, and he told them, search the scriptures, for they testify of him. Right? Way back telling the Pharisees, right? So again, we know for a fact this is foretelling the Lord Jesus Christ. And we know for a fact removing the to be will make it basically removing the prophecy of Jesus Christ. That he's going to be alive when he's put on the tree. Right? He doesn't care because he's decided. They've both admitted there's no grammatical error. They've both admitted that it fits the Lord Jesus Christ scripturally. So why is it being called a typo? Why is it being called an error? And the only answer is pride. He knows Greek and Hebrew now. He doesn't need the King James Bible anymore. He makes the rules. He overwrites God's word. Again, I don't know how you can possibly act like that's no big deal. Because guess what? If he didn't see this for years, how many other typos? And how come for centuries, nobody else could see this typo? He had to do it. And he's the only one who could see it. All the scholars, all the scribes, every Christian on planet Earth who spoke English has read this chapter for centuries. But we need him to do it, right? We need him to rewrite the Bible for us and go back to the Hebrew. No, you don't speak Hebrew, folks. It's a dead language. Did it ever occur to you? That you don't speak Hebrew as good as Almighty God, who is in charge of preserving His Word? Did that ever occur to you? No, it didn't because you've been preaching it wrong, like He said, and He doesn't want to admit to being wrong. That's all it is. Again, him and James White, he has to go apologize to James White now. I corrected the error, James White, in the King James Bible because I went back to the Hebrew just like you, James White. Is he going to go bow down before James White now and say, I was wrong. James White, I was wrong. You're right. We can use the Hebrew to correct the Bible. Again, folks, is that what King James only is now? Where, oh, I'll just change it at a whim because I don't like the way it's worded. There's no error there. I'm going to change the meaning of the prophecy, the meaning of the verse, because I feel like it. Let's look at what the old Stephen Anderson would say about this. All the time, like want not, waste not, like, for Polly's want of a cracker, the battle was lost. Definitive, which is exactly what we have in Deuteronomy 21-22, B to B, 
This means expressing an appointed or arranged future action, hence also expressing necessity, obligation, duty, fitness, or appropriateness, which is exactly what we have in Deuteronomy 21-22. Saying that the English construction isn't possible, that's not the point. Again, in my sermon, when I got to this verse, I just dealt with the text as it was written, B to B, and obviously it's, it's possible. The reason why it's not correct is because of the fact that it doesn't match the hebrew that's the whole point is that how did i know that this is a typo and not just some strange wording or whatever uh because of the fact that first of all the king james is based on the bishop's bible the bishop's bible has it worded the right way that matches what the hebrew explicitly says why would the king james translators come along and take an accurate translation of the verse that matches the hebrew perfectly and change it to this awkward reading that deviates from the plain reading of the Hebrew text. And look, the Hebrew text is crystal clear in this verse. Obviously, if someone wants to try to read this B to B reading back into it, they can come up with some theoretical, exotic usages of Hebrew grammar. But if you actually just read the verse in Hebrew, and look, when I looked up this verse in Hebrew, you know, it's, it's, it's actually a really straightforward verse. I didn't have to look anything up. I just pulled out a Hebrew Bible, looked at it. It was obvious right away what it was saying. And so by looking at the Hebrew, looking at the Tyndale, the bishops, Occam's razor, folks, the simplest explanation is probably right, that it's probably just a typographical error because there are typos. Yeah, and that was one of, part of his response to Mark Ward. I just wanted to show out... You know, he doubled down on it, that it's, he thinks it's an error. And Mark Ward is over there like, in English, what? He be to be in English, Oxford Dictionary is talking about. That's foretelling what? A future event. Well, is this prophecy or not? Again, Galatians confirms this is prophecy. So again, the problem isn't. Hebrew, that he doesn't speak, that nobody speaks, is dead language, that you have to trust that God preserved enough of it. The problem isn't Hebrew. The problem is you don't believe this is a prophecy, that it was just retrofitted after the fact to be a prophecy. No, it's a prophecy, folks. He knows what he's doing. But if there's no error, it would be an error, right? If you changed it to no longer be prophecy, because then when you see it in Galatians and all these places where they hearken back to it, you'd say, well, that's already done with. That's not a prophecy, right? Again, trying to change it actually changes the meaning in multiple places and changes the prophecy. It's not just a typo, folks. And if there's no grammatical error, why were you even looking to make up an excuse for it in the first place. Let's look what the old King Stephen Anderson would say. You can just come out with some foolish version, call it the standard. This is and always has been and always will be the standard by which every other version is compared. Why? Because it is the finished product. Done. You say, oh, let's revise it. It's done. And it has stood the test of time for over 400 years. And if it ain't broke, don't fix it. This is the one that we can trust in the English language. You say, well, you got to go back to the Greek and Hebrew. Well, here's the problem with that. You don't speak Greek and Hebrew. So what good is a Bible going to do you in a language that you don't speak? It's going to do you no good at all. You need the Bible in your own native tongue. We need the Bible in our native tongue. And even if you learned Greek and Hebrew as a second language, you're never going to understand it as well as your native tongue. You're trying to replace a bad version. We're going from good to better to best here. I mean, these are good translations. The Geneva Bible is good. The Bishop Bible is good. We're just going to perfect it and get it just dialed in. So from 1604 to 1610, the KJV was translated by 54 of the greatest scholars that existed at that time. Just to give you one example, one guy, Lancelot Andrews, was an expert in Latin, Greek, Hebrew, Chaldean, Syriac, Arabic, and he also spoke 15 modern languages. That's one guy out of the 54 people that translated the King James Bible over the course of seven years. Yeah, and you see it for yourself, folks. 
that's what he used to believe, right? That one guy, 54 languages or whatever it is, Lancelot, again, he doesn't know anything because, you know, Steven Anderson looked it up in the Hebrew and he says it's got to be a printer error or something. It has to be because he just decided that because he's been teaching it wrong. He doesn't want to admit he's wrong. Instead, he wants to correct the King James Bible. And we saw itself. This is the finished product. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. But now he speaks Hebrew and Greek, so he knows a little better than the Word of God now. He's going to go in here and he's going to scratch out that to be because that's prophecy. And we all know this verse has nothing to do with prophecy, right? Except the New Testament authors told you it did. Again, if you remove the prophecy... It would be meaningless. It would be incorrect. But that's okay because he went back to the Hebrew. And he knows Hebrew better than everybody else because he said so, right? Oh, wait. No, he didn't. He actually taught the opposite. You don't go back to the Greek and Hebrew. He taught the opposite. This is the finished product. He taught the opposite. This is the perfect word of God. What happened? What happened? Look at 1 Corinthians 8. 1 Corinthians 8. Now, as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet, as he ought to know. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. Again, you know nothing yet, as he ought to know. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. Again, he knows Hebrew and Greek now, so what happened? Now the darkness has identified his weakness, right? Pride. Knowledge has puffed him up. Why are you looking at the King James Bible? You can go look at the Hebrew. You can make a correction on your own, right? That snake said, has God really said to be to be as if it were in a prophecy? Maybe you should go look at the Hebrew. You're so smart, Stephen Anderson. You've learned Hebrew and Greek. You didn't go to Bible college, but you're so smart. Now you can look at the Hebrew and Greek on your own. You don't need that King James Bible. You don't need to trust the Word of God anymore, right? You can trust your own knowledge of languages, just like James White does, right? That's exactly what happened to him, that voice whispering to him. Oh, it's got to be an error because I've been teaching it wrong. I'm not going to let the Bible correct me. I'll find an excuse. I'll go back to the Hebrew and rewrite the Bible. And that's what happened here. Knowledge puffed him up. And now he's forgotten the very things that have come out of his own mouth. This is the finished product. This is perfect. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And yet he still says he's King James only. Maybe he's King James only sometimes, unless he thinks there's a typo. And now he's sown the seed of doubt into his own mind. What other typos has he missed over the years that can change the meaning of a prophecy? Sounds like a big typo to me. Sounds like removing whole words right? Removing the meaning of the whole verse. It's very dangerous, folks. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. Again, pray that he gets back on track because, hey, maybe he's already looking for other typos in the King James Bible. Maybe he's already putting Hebrew and Greek, which he says himself he doesn't know better than his native language, or these 50 scholars over seven years, which he has admitted himself he doesn't know is good. Maybe he's already looking for more errors in the King James Bible, right? Even where there are no errors. It's the most insane thing I've ever seen. He admits grammatically there's no error in the English. So why does he assume there's error? He's going back to Hebrew, folks. Again, the Word of God is not bound. A very sad thing. Somebody who's made all these King James only Bibles pride tearing him down now darkness will attack him continually every time he reads the king james bible well maybe that's a typo maybe i should check it with the hebrew and now that seed of doubt is sown hopefully he gets back on track but that's all that's going on just like the snake told eve did god really say that right basically same thing here did god really say to be is it to be as if a prophecy of he's gonna be hung on a tree did god really say that and stephen anderson went Looked in the Hebrew, changed his whole doctrine, totally left the f uh, whole idea of King James only. And now, when he preaches King James only, is he going to say 
oh, it's totally free from errors. No, now he's going to say, well, there might be some typo errors, right? Is that the same as saying not one jot or tittle shall pass? Because removing two words sounds like a jot or a tittle, doesn't it? That to be shouldn't be there. That sounds like more than a jot. That sounds like more than a tittle. So no, he's not King James only anymore. He might consider himself that, but he doesn't believe the King James Bible is without error, and he believes the Hebrew that he admittedly does not speak as well as English can correct the King James Bible, and he brings out the Bishop Bible and the Tyndale's Bible, which he knows God could have chosen one of those. He chose the King James Bible. So now he's saying that God made a mistake and should have chose one of those, right? Because he's putting them up as superior, as more perfect, right? But to make matters even worse, his testimony a long time ago in one of his videos was that they were trying to get him to stop using the King James Bible at one of the churches when he was a child or younger, a boy or whatever it is. And he said he felt like God himself was protecting him by giving him this King James Bible. So now, not only has he rejected everything he's ever taught, he's rejected his own testimony that God himself gave him the King James Bible to use above every other version. And he said, no, I'll go back to the Hebrew. No, thanks. By his own testimony, he's, hum I mean, it's just a joke, folks. There's no error there. Why is he coming out attacking the King James Bible? Pride, knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifies. That's all that this is. Again, he's coming against his own testimony, his own teachings for years. It's no big deal. It's just a typo. Well, if it changes the meaning of the prophecy and it's removing two whole words from the Bible, you better believe that's a big deal. That's more than a jot. That's more than a tittle. And it's been centuries and no Christian has been able to find this typo but you. That seems a little bit strange, doesn't it? But you can't be wrong. It must be the Bible that's wrong. Yeah, that sounds like King James only, doesn't it? Again, pray for them. Pray for Ken Ham too. Again, I'm not trying to attack them. It's just so shocking to me to see someone flip 180 on what he taught in the past out of the blue like this. And it's not out of the blue. Evil's probably been attacking him this whole time. Oh, you're so good at languages. You're so good at languages. You don't. Oh, you can look at the Hebrew. Why are you looking at the English? Right? That's exactly what's been going on. And now he'll always have that doubt when he's reading the Bible. Oh, maybe that's a typo. Maybe I better check the Hebrew. Maybe I better check a different language. Maybe I better check a different version. So go hug James White, James White 2.0. Admit that you believe what James White believes, that you have to go back to the Hebrew to correct the errors in the King James Bible. And then lie to everybody else that you're King James only. Right? No, that's absurd. It's a sad state of affairs. And oh, it's no big deal. It's just the perfect word of God. Again, nothing matters anymore to anybody. It's no big deal. It's just a perfect word of God. It's just a prophecy for telling the Lord Jesus Christ hung on a tree for the sins of the whole world. It's no big deal. Let's move on. Colossians 1. Verse 24 is another one they use that I've noticed has been attacked, used for people to be deceived, right? People have brought this up. And I'm like, where are they getting this from? They're getting it from these new Bible versions. So it's like Colossians 1. Again, it's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, start on verse 10, that you might walk worthy of the Lord in all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers in the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us in the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him, should all fullness dwell, and having made peace through the blood of the cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometime alienated, and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. 
and the body of his flesh through death to present you holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight if you continue in the faith grounded and settled. And be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ and my flesh for the, his body's sake, which is the church, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you, to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which has been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest." To his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of his glory, of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man, and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we present every man perfect in Christ Jesus, whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh mightily in me, and me mightily. Ah, forgive me. Uh, tongue tied for a second there. So verse... 24 is the one they attack. Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. He's talking about he's working, Paul, apostle of Jesus Christ, working for Jesus Christ. God's working in him for the church. Now, the new versions I've noticed have changed this. To what is what Christ was lacking, like he has to make up his own salvation, like Christ wasn't enough. Very interesting that they would try and change this verse. Let's look. Again, forgive the quality. Here's the NIV version. Now I rejoice in what I'm suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. Again, it makes it sound like Jesus Christ didn't fulfill what he came to do almost. They change it subtly like that, right? It's not an accident, folks, right? And we see this very, again, compared to the original, where he's working for the church, what Christ left behind his church, as opposed to what Christ is lacking, right? Right? And the ESV, let's get all different versions. The ESV, in my flesh, I'm filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Very interesting. A lot of them do this. So, again, let's get a whole list here. HCSB, what is lacking? Was that the ISV? Whatever remains. Oh my gosh, I don't even know what this Phillips one is. It's huge. Again. Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. LSB, I fill up what is lacking of Christ's afflictions. Very interesting change. Something I wanted to warn you about. And the NS NASB, which again, Ken, Ho I mean, Ken Ham is recommending. Notice what it says. I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake and in my flesh I am supplementing what is lacking in Christ's afflictions in behalf of his body with his church? Now, maybe you think I'm reading too much in that. That's a kind of a big change if Christ's afflictions are now lacking as opposed to you working for his church that he left behind. Very different. Very different, right? Because people who want to add works will say that wasn't enough. That's something to watch out for. Colossians 1.24. So beware of the Colossians 1.24 Again, people are trying to use that to add works in. That's something I don't think we covered before. And before we run out of time, let's look at the 66. The two reasons people say 66 books is confirmed that I've heard anyway. There might be more. Look at those real quick before we move on if we got time. So first, there's this interesting bit here I see on the internet about the the whole debate is we've got the King James Bible, the 66 books. Then there's what's called the Apocrypha or the Deuterocanon which means Deuterocanon is another canon. That should automatically give you a hint. But, so there's the people who say they should be in there. That's 73 books. But then if you have the Eastern Orthodox, right, they have 81 books, I believe. So we've got three different numbers here, right? And what's interesting is, I saw on this Orthodox website here, let's see what it says. The Orthodox Church has not, as yet, translated the Bible in English, and so has no official English translation. In the meantime, the Orthodox are temporarily using 
both the King James Version and the Revised Standard Version. Again, very interesting that they would also use the King James Version in English, right? Again, why in English, right? It's a global language, folks. And guess what? It's perfect. God has preserved it. So even people who have different number of canons are using the King James Version. Think about that. Catholic and Orthodox have both used the King James Version. It's only now you're being flooded with all these new versions. And the RSV version that it mentions is already dead because they took out the virgin birth. And people are catching on to that, right? So we've got the 81 from Eastern Orthodox, the 73, which is the Bible with the Apocrypha or Deuterocanon in it. And then we have the King James Bible, which you can get with the Apocrypha if you really want to, but it's just the 66 books. So the two things I've seen that people use to confirm the 66 books, I'll share them with you here. Again, whether you believe them or not, we know that God has preserved his word. Well, some of us do, and King James only, right? Isaiah chapter 30, Old Testament, verse 8. Now go, write it before them at a table, and note it in a book, that it may be for the time to come, forever and ever, that this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord, which say to the seers, see not, and to the prophets, the prophets prophesy not unto us right things, speak unto us smooth things, prophesy, deceits, get you out of the way, turn aside out of the path, Cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. Wherefore, thus saith the Holy One of Israel, Because ye despise this word, and trust in oppression and perverseness, and stay thereon, therefore this iniquity shall be to you, as a breach ready to fall, swelling out in the high wall, whose breaking coming, coming suddenly at an instant. And he shall break it as the breaking of the potter's vessel that is broken in pieces. He shall not spare, so that it shall not be found in the bursting of it, assured to take fire from the hearth, are to take water with all out of the pit. For thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, and returning in rest shall you be saved, and quietness and, conf and confidence shall be your strength, and you would not. Well, Isaiah 30, we see, write it in the book forever and ever, right? And so the first thing they'll use is the book of Isaiah. So basically they link up Isaiah as a mini confirmation of the 66 books because it has 66 chapters and they do Bible studies, of course, connecting them with the books of the Bible. Some say it's a complete study. Some say it's only partial. But the main divider they need is the Old Testament from the New Testament, right? So they use chapter 40 for that. So let's look at Isaiah chapter 40. Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, say it through God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned. For as she hath received the Lord's hand double for all her sins, the voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way the Lord makes straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough places plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. The voice said, Cry, and he said, What shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, because the Spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. O Zion, that bringeth good tidings, Get thee up into the high mountain, O Jerusalem, that bringeth good tidings. Lift up thy voice with strength. Lift it up. Be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God will come with strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward with him is with him, and his work before him. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm, and carry them in his bosom, and shall gently lay those that are with young. So we see that voice crying in the wilderness, right? Like John the Baptist, we see in the New Testament. He's crying in the wilderness. And then we see what? Behold your God, right? So again, after John the Baptist, we see Jesus Christ himself is shown to the people, right? So there's that natural division in Isaiah that they use, as well as other verses in Isaiah. And of course, trying to correspond to chapters per book. 
but that's the natural division you need because you're going to say it's 39 books of the Old Testament, right? And 27 of the New. So that's the division you need. So 66 books of Isaiah, 66 chapters of Isaiah, 66 books of the Bible. That's the first one. And the only second one I heard is one about the candlestick. So let's look at Matthew chapter 5 real quick. Verse 13, Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt hath lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is then for good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So here you're likened, right? A candle that goes on a candlestick to give light to the whole house. So we go to Exodus 25. This is one I heard from somebody that, again, I'm just sharing. I think it's interesting. And keep in mind the people that say, oh, how can it be 66 books? Again, thankfully, we don't have to worry about that. God's already preserved his word. He's already done it, right? It's already done. There's no uncompiling the Bible and recompiling it every year to try and figure out. No, it's already done. But the 66 chapters of Isaiah and this part here, that's more than they have. They don't have anything for the 73 or 81, right? They have just trust me, bro. That's what they have, right? Even though it'll say in some parts that it's not even written by a prophet, the book that they want to put in, they don't care what it says, right? Again, it's just a power trip for them, right? Even though he says he's not a prophet, Maccabees, they'll still try and shove it in there. He says there's no prophet in the land. They don't care, right? So let's look at Exodus 25. This is where they get 66 as well, some people. Some people obviously probably won't like it, but let's talk about the candlestick. Verse 31, And thou shalt make a candlestick of pure gold, of beaten work shall the candlestick be made. His shaft and his branches, his bowls, his knops, and his flowers shall be of the same. And six branches shall come out of the sides of it. Three branches of the candlestick out of the one side, and three branches of the candlestick out of the other side. Three bowls made like an almonds with a knop and a flower in one branch and three bowls made like almonds in the other branch with a knop and a flower. So in the six branches that come out of the candlestick and in the candlestick shall be four bowls made like an almonds with their knops and their flowers. And there should be a knop under two branches of the same and a knop under two branches of the same and a knop under the two branches of the same according to the six branches that proceed out of the candlestick. So the only thing I've heard people count it like this, depending on how you view it here, you've got the six branches and then you've got three branches on each side, right? And you have the three bowls like are almonds and they have a knob and a flower. So that would be, so if you're counting them each on one branch, you'd have the almond bowl, the knop, and a flower, right? But you have three of them, so that'd be nine on one branch. And there's six branches. So nine times six is 54, right? And on the main part of the candlestick, you have the four bowls with their knobs. That would be four, right? But there's three, so that's four times three, that's 12. So what's 54 and 12? That's, you guessed it. 66. So 66 of the ornaments make up that candlestick, right? And of course, the Spirit of Christ is in you, gives you that light, right? And you've got God's Word here, right? The 66 books. So they use this as well to confirm the 66 books of the Bible. Of course, if you counted it different, you're not going to get the 73 or 81, right? So it only can come out to 66 or you think it's just random, right? So here's one of the sites I saw about how they tried to have a little picture. Again, I don't think this is accurate to how they draw it, but I guess it's some kind of Albany Baptist, which they talk about the 66 books. If you count it like this, it adds up, what, 54, and then the stem, 12, and so forth. 
It's got a whole little Bible study there about that. But those are the only two I've seen about the 66. But just remember, again, that's more than the 73 and the 81 have. They don't have any of it from what I've seen. Very interesting. Again, God has preserved his word in the King James Bible. If it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? As they say. And there's more I could cover. I'll have to do it another video, I think. Let's end it here on 1 Corinthians 2. And there's always more examples for King James only as it covers the whole Bible, right? Start on verse 7. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But that is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered in the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that we may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Again, interesting verse here. We're talking about King James only. We speak not in the words which man wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So, again, one of the arguments they'll use, oh, we have to update the language and use different words. Again, it's already in English, folks. It's already translated. It's already in English. So... Are you going to just put a bunch of slang in here? Are you going to put a bunch of emojis, a bunch of nonsense? No. This verse has no meaning if you're just going to keep changing all the words when you think it needs to be updated, right? It has no meaning to them because they they basically just say, well, let's just keep updating it, right? We'll keep changing it until it's unrecognizable. And that's basically what they want. The idea that you would go to God's word and actually increase your vocabulary if there's something you don't understand. Actually increase your English vocabulary. Actually learn phrases like to be, right? Talking about the future. You know, actually learn things from God's word is totally strange to them. Right? They think, well, man's wisdom teaches we should use these words. No, what does God teach, right? Again, this is a powerful verse against those who constantly complain that it needs to be updated into something they like better, right? Again, what words do they want to use? It's already in English. They just want to change the words now, right? We're supposed to use what God teaches us. Again, so we saw the Word of God is not bound to one particular piece of paper or rock. You don't have... The originals. There is no going back to the originals, folks. You don't have the originals. You either believe God has preserved his word or he hasn't. There is no going back to the Hebrew. God foretold he would speak to you in another tongue. Do you believe that or do you not believe it? Again, there are people who do not believe it and think God's word is trapped in Hebrew forever. That's what they believe. And there are people who say, oh, it's too hard to understand. We need to change the words. No, use the words that God teaches. And there are people who don't believe in the preservation of God's word, right? Which we saw that even Ken Ham is being deceived now with this LSB. Ken, uh, Stephen Anderson coming out saying there are errors in the Bible now for no reason. I mean, there was no error there to be explained. He just said, oh, it's a typo because I said so because he knows Hebrew now and he's puffed up, right? And then he even goes on to say 
that he knows the preservation of God's word because of the Hebrew and Greek. Really? Before you learned Hebrew and Greek, why did you believe in the preservation of God's word? Right? Had nothing to do with your knowledge of Hebrew and Greek. Had to do with you trusting the promises of God and knowing God. Now it has to do with what? His puffed up wisdom that he thinks he knows the languages. Don't. Again, it can happen to anybody, folks. That's the point. It's not to pick on one person. It could happen to anybody. Reject pride. Ask God to help protect you from pride because we can't do it ourselves, right? We humble ourselves before him. We can't protect ourselves from pride. We need him to protect us. We can't do anything without him. We need him to teach us and to guide us in all things. That's just a fact, including teaching us his word, teaching us about King James only, right? Teaching us all these things. Again, and it's 66 books. He foretold it would be another tongue. Why wouldn't it be English, right? That's what they can't answer. Why wouldn't it when it already is historically? You've seen it. And we saw in that person of interest book, some of these languages didn't even have written alphabets yet. The missionaries had to bring them, the King James Bible, the Bible, whatever they had at that time, and teach them their own alphabet. So why wouldn't it be in English if they didn't even have an alphabet yet in their language? Right? And God foretold another tongue. I wanted to point that out and I got sidetracked and all these other issues. But still related to King James only. Watch out for Colossians 124, which people are using. And God bless you and keep you. You can trust the word of God. It's perfect. God bless you and keep you in Jesus' name. Amen.